and welcome to the first trading day for this week. Good morning, good evening, wherever in the world you're watching from. It's Business Morning Live from Channel's Global HQ right here in Lagos. Before you make that trade, let's get to the top stories that set your agenda uh, for today. Chicago wheat futures gain more ground um, today with uh, strong global demand supporting the markets. Although ample supplies from the Black Sea region are likely to limit the upside potential in prices, uh, soybeans uh, rose uh, recouping some of the previous session's um, losses on harvest downgrades in the United States. The most active wheat contract on the Chicago Board of Trade, CBOT, uh, was up by 0.4% at $5.82 for a quarter of a bushel. Soy soybeans, um, SV1, added 0.6% to $12.88 a bushel. And corn, CV1, climbed 0.5% to $4.95 for three quarter of a bushel. A severe drought is uh, disrupting uh, bars traffic on the Tapajos River in the Amazon rainforest with shipping agencies uh, told uh, clients this week as Brazil enters the final month of 2023's corn export season. And to the FX market, now see Forex trading on the FM DQ exchange ended the second week of October last week positive as the total turnover rose by 109.52% week on week to $683.97 million. And that was Friday, October the 13th. Um, highlights of transactions carried out uh, for the week shows that the FX spot market recorded 109.84% increase to settle at $682.92 uh, .92 million. At the same time, Turnover in the FX derivatives segment rose by 6.06%, and this was solely driven by activities in FX forwards turnover. And to the global oil market now, we see um, oil traded mostly flat uh, today after surging last week as investors uh, wait to see if the Israel-Hamas conflict uh, draws in other countries, a development that would potentially drive up prices further and uh, deal a fresh blow to the global economy. Uh, Brent futures uh, was last flat at $90.89 per barrel, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude was down two cents to $87.67 a barrel. Uh, both benchmarks climbed nearly 6% on Friday, posting their highest daily percentage gains since April, as investors priced in the possibility of a wider Middle East conflict. And officials of the Abuja Chamber of Commerce and uh, Industry have been speaking on the need for small business owners in the country to tap into the federal government's funding for gas infrastructure. Speaking ahead of its Domestic Gas Infrastructure Summit in Abuja, the chairman of the ACCI Energy Trade Group, Mr. Shibu Madwako, explains that the nation possesses huge gas deposits that must be harnessed towards the socioeconomic development of the country. Take a listen. Subsidy has been reduced. The cost of um, the cost of uh, petrol, and that's vis-a-vis -vis processed crude oil, is tied to the to the dollar at the moment, and everybody is screaming. But meanwhile, we have a large deposit of gas in Nigeria. This gas, you can get it for how much? Much cheaper than crude oil, much cheaper than PMS petrol. And we're saying, let us use this to develop this country. Let us use this to, to go about our daily activities in Nigeria. Gas is cheap in Nigeria. Why don't we use it to build the economy? That is the drive. So we're here again this year to create awareness to Nigerians that, look, there are so many uses for gas. There are so many opportunities in the gas, in the gas uh, space. And that Nigerians should start thinking gas. That should be the narrative. And we should start building infrastructure on gas as well. That's the drive of the uh, Abuja Chamber of Commerce. What do we do with our gas deposits when we know we have a potential to still utilize our gas deposits? So I think, yes, there is a push for uh, renewables, but also we still have to continue utilizing, utilizing our gas deposits to uh, develop our countries uh, in Africa and Nigeria especially. And to our first um, conversation now, the central bank um, of Nigeria is reversed an eight-year-old uh, policy uh, that previously prohibited importers of 43 items ranging from rice to milk from accessing dollars through banks. With the removal of foreign exchange uh, restrictions, let's explore who stands to gain and who may face um, setbacks. Joining us for this uh, conversation now is Mr. Ayodeji Ebo, MD Optimus uh, by Afrinvest, uh, joining me via Zoom. Uh, great to have you. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. 
and it's great to be here. Fantastic. So I, I remember many analysts and experts were clamoring for importers of the 43 items to have access uh, to the official FX uh, market, but it seems now we have it. It's being criticized, you know, right now by some quarters. Uh, first of all, Mr. Ebo, how did you see this move by the CBN? Okay, thank you very much. And um, I see this as a positive uh, move. Um, I'm also one of those that clamor, uh, that are, are clamored for the uh, removal of the restrictions. Uh, because what, why this is not a silver bullet to solving the FX problem, what we observe is the demand shift. So if we look at it in 2015, when the items when the items were banned it created it moved the demand from the official market to the unofficial market and activities there created the uh, began to create that spread uh, that we we currently see in the market so but what i would say is that beyond just uh, removing or removing the ban that's from participating in the nigerian fx market or the official window there's also a need to supply because what we we'll typically see now is that it's, it's a demand shift. So the demand, again, would move back to the official window. And the question everyone will be asking is, does the CBN have the effects to supply to be able to meet demand? So what we would see, there will be initial major pressure and within that market. Currently, I think as of Friday, the uh, Nigerian foreign exchange uh, market uh, rate closed around I think 749 or 759 Naira to a dollar. We would, uh, we would see if the, if the CBN ensures that there a, is a willing buyer, willing seller market, we will see that shift towards, even if not above 800 Naira to a dollar because uh, at the initial stage before supply would improve. But what which we would also expect as we progress, once there's supply, it, the only con first condition here that has to be fulfilled is that supply. Once there's supply, then we'll begin to see a moderation from the unofficial market. The pressure will reduce and convergence will begin. Because if there's no convergence, uh, even those that import, that need the dollar uh, to import those items, when they have proceeds to sell, well, if, they, if they export, at what rate do you want them to sell it? Is it at the official market rate or at the uh, parallel market rate? Once the gap is wide, like we currently have, almost close to 300 Naira, it's going to be an incentive for people to run trips. So you'll be supplying them dollar at the official market and they will be selling at the unofficial market. So beyond this, there's a need to increase supply so that we can begin to see convergence of uh, between the two markets. So I, I guess it's one thing to have access and it's another thing to actually get the dollars in that um, market. But break it for me now, um, who would you say are the gainers um, with the 43 items uh, readmission? Okay, thank you. Very interesting question. So first of all, we would look at and identify who are those that makes are on this list and when you check most of them uh, you have manufacturing a brick sector also the euro bonds market sometimes we underestimate the liquidity they can provide so when you check the current when you check the current um say checking the the current uh, total outstanding euro bonds is about 15 billion dollars and is estimated that about 20 percent are currently held by local investors. When you see the activity that they do most times, sometimes it can be as much as 30, 40 million dollars of buy and sell at, at, that they do in a week. That liquidity would up, would move into the market. For them, they would be one of the winners because rather than buying at the current rate, if they are supplied, you know, I'm using the condition, if they are, are supplied at the official market, it means the return to an average investor that is converting Naira to invest in Euro bond would be higher because you are buying at a lesser price. Also, the banks would, would also be a major, uh, would benefit from this because 
when you discover when we had the 40 percent adjustment a lot of them booked uh, fx gains we expect that there will be pressure in the official market that would also lead to the depreciation of the naira which will be positive for for most of the banks that are long in dollar assets that's also been and also there are some importers of some major items that are not really being produced there is no substitute for them here in nigeria um, they are not they are, there's no production here and they are not competing they would also have access if they are supplied to cheaper source of, of dollars compared to the black market because yes why we expect a convergence we, there may still be a spread uh, in, in a, a little bit of spread in, in that market so those are what I feel initially I feel that would be the major gainers in in this and overall we expect that the economy should also benefit once there's stability. Once there's supply, when there's st stability, I will provide confidence in the market and we begin to attract uh, inflows, then would we'll also benefit because the way it's been going in the past six or seven months, it's been impacting on consumer wallets. And these um, 43 items were, were excluded to, you know, help promote local production. Is it safe to say that the losers might be the local producers of these items? Okay, thank you. Y yes, so um, I think it's a chicken and egg situation uh, because some of even the high terms uh, we are not very sufficient currently in the country. While it may impact and may they will need to be more competitive. The federal government can also look for other ways, like cost of funds to them. If you reduce the cost of funds to them, it will also help them be able to reduce the cost of their products. If we improve on infrastructure, we provide power, we provide good roads, that would also impact and make them more competitive. So, while the monetary policy is doing its own part, the fiscal authorities have a major role, especially the government. They have a major role to play to see how they can help make this, uh, this uh, com companies more competitive. Uh, it's, I think it's important. We need to make them more competitive. And it's not just about excluding them. Excluding them from the FX market is not necessarily going to make them competitive. Also, there's, uh, it's about those inefficiencies that we need to work on to reduce the cost of production. So that over time, even for those that items that were importing, I always make reference to cars, to encourage local production, we have increased the tariff that you pay almost two times of the price you purchase the car to bring it here in Nigeria. We suffering it, is it helping our economy? Have we been able to produce? So these are some of the things that needs to be reviewed and at the end of the day, it will reduce the pressure that we continue to have on our, our pockets. Right, production, production, production. But how does this play you know, into the inflation story? We're expecting inflation numbers uh, for September uh, today. Do you see you know, positive for the inflation story going forward? Uh, no, I, I, thought, I think it's too early to, um, to be able to be tying this to inflation numbers. Yes, for September, based on projection, I think about uh, we expect it to moderate from last month, but will still remain, I think, high. Um, projection here is about 26.8% 20, um, compared to 25.8% last, uh, last month. However, they, we believe that there's still one necessary factor, one condition that needs to be fulfilled, which is supply. There's a need to improve supply. When you check average turnover on the now the, the formerly known as the investors and exporters window, it's currently average around $109 million. Compared to what we used to have in 2019, 2018, which was as high as $250 million on the average for the year. So if we don't improve on the supply, no matter how interesting a policy may sound, it's not going to solve that particular problem, may even cause more pain. So there's a need to back that up with significant supply such that we'll be able to get that the right benefit that we expect from this uh, good, uh, this interesting policy that has just been made.
Yeah, very interesting policy. But we're expecting that inflation numbers today. What are you expecting? How bad? Okay. <laughs> Could it yeah, be? so if I'm going to take a bet based on our projection, is about 26.8%. Uh, we still feel the uh, closure of the border will continue to weigh on food inflation. The exchange rate we've seen and uh, as at the end of last month uh, was almost close to 1,000 Naira. That would impact on imported items. Uh, the price of diesel was also high due to crude oil prices. So that all those several factors would impact on inflation rate. So we expect it to go higher um, yeah, for the, the month of September compared to uh, August. Uh, definitely. It looks like um, it appears the government is actually listening to most of the uh, recommendations like uh, this uh, 43 items issue. You did mention the borders now. Do you think the government is going to do something about the borders? Yes, I think they will. But, you know, beyond the closure of the border, um, the coup, the uh, political crisis going on there is also part of what is impacting and also based on the position that we have also taken. But there's a need now that we are not self-sufficient in those things, there are other areas we can look at to make those local production competitive. It is not about just um, banning those items from coming in or increasing tariff, making it more expensive for people to bring them in. If we give them, subsidize it, rather than the money we are collecting from tariff, we subsidize it based on the funding to them, use those money, we build roads to encourage them, give them tax breaks, and we focus, once we focus on that, it will be very difficult to import items, imported items to compete with um, locally made items because this is, we talk about proximity to markets. So that's, it's, it will reduce that cost. But internally, there's a lot that has to be done around infrastructure. Rail system would be a major breaker for us if we're able to get it right in moving goods around in Nigeria. All right, looking at the equities market now, last week was a, a positive uh, move we saw for the, for the trading week. But, you know, with this, um, uh, on that of the 43 items, which stocks do you think or which sectors um, on the equities market do you think is going to profit from this or actually take a loss? Okay, thanks. So I expect the banks to profit from this because of the expected adjustments in the official markets. And we, we feel for manufacturing uh, companies, especially those that uh, have item inputs on that, on that list, and uh, we, we, we think that in the medium to long term, because until we begin to see supply, in the medium to long term, it may impact if they are not competitive on their ability, on their revenue because of um, their cost of production. Uh, the likes of the agri sector, Presco, Okomu benefited significantly from the ban, and uh, because a lot of uh, manufacturing companies had to look in what, and that increased their demand. So I feel that the, it's enough time to have given them that learning curve. Uh, yes, why there are some inefficiencies they don't have control over, but um, I think uh, over time they will also um, be able to weather weather the storm. I think by and large, uh, we still expect that there will be a bit of um, corrections. Uh, we need to get the FX markets um, right first before we would attract uh, foreign portfolio investors into our market that will further propel uh, retail investors. Yes, we are doing a lot in the last three years holding the market to this level, but there's a limit to how we can um, grow this market without the inflow, major inflow from foreign portfolio investors. Yeah, local investors have been quite uh, impressive in the market. But, you know, going forward now, how can the government increase flow of uh, USD into, in, in the short term and, you know, get the exporters to actually sell their dollars uh, to the banks from their proceeds instead of the parallel market? Okay, I think the first thing, yes, is a tough decision. They need to come up with more structures. We, we, we spoke about the Afrexim, $3 billion. Is there any structure with NMPC they can come up with? IMF, they need at least, they need to come up with structure. Is there another $3 billion they can access? And now, yes, it may look very expensive. Going to the euro bonds market, there's appetites. Uh, they can um, also raise some funds, whether it's about 2 or $3 billion. We need that to improve on supply. If we don't improve on supply and the 
variance is still significant. It will be very difficult to convince the exports, exporters to sell in the official markets. They will look for ways that government will not have control over to sell at the uh, parallel market. So once the first step is increased supply to begin to close the gap so that there's no incentive for round tripping or selling at the official market. And once we're able to close that gap, remittances is also a major uh, area that would help. There are a lot of platforms now that are trying to help uh, to bring in money to into the country. But if we don't close that gap, most people will continue to use the unofficial markets. Uh, he estimated about $20 billion. So even if it's 10, 50 percent of that we can attract to the official market, it's also going to create liquidity. And over time, we we'll begin to see FPI inflow. Once there's consistency in policy, FPI inflow and FDI would also follow. And we'll be able to create that stability that I think we, we desire. We've seen it in 2017, after the implementation of the i &E window, for over three years, because there was stability in, in, in policy, we saw the consistent inflow. And it was also beneficial to Nigeria because we could project and uh, the Naira was very stable for a very long period before COVID-19 uh, pandemic struck. All right, Mr. Ebo, thank you so much. I wish we could all agree to, you know, reduce demand in, in that um, other market and, you know, get some strength uh, into the Naira. Thank you so much uh, for your perspective today, Mr. Ayoda J. Ebo, MD, um, Optimus by Afrinvest. Thank you. Always my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, after the break, as the meetings, the IMF World Bank meetings end in America, as we get a summary of proceedings, uh, that's um, after uh, the break. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. Welcome back. Well, the Development Bank of Nigeria was well represented at the just concluded IMF World Bank uh, meetings in Marrakesh. The managing director, Dr. Tony uh, Panachi, who had a chat with our correspondent, Ine John McRapp, shared their expectation uh, for more funding and motivation to improve domestic revenue in a bid to accelerate impact in Nigeria. Take a listen. of the main partners and the World Bank is uh, one of the major funders in terms of um, um, debt we provided us and all our other development partners are also here uh, the likes of the AFD and so on and so forth so it's an opportunity for us to also meet with our development partners and have some conversations and see how we can catalyze more funding for DBN going into the future. So what will be your reaction to this conversation on um, we should, as Africa, we should not just be looking for funding, we should look for knowledge, we should look for how to improve our resources inwards instead of always looking for financing from outside. That's a very good conversation and actually, um, as you know, even at DBN, for example, if you look at our core mandates, one of the core mandates is technical assistance in terms of capacity building. So our knowledge is quite key. So financing obviously comes at the end because if you don't have the knowledge, uh, the capacity, how are you going to deploy the financing that you get? So it's quite important. And most importantly, uh, in Africa, um, a lot of funding has been coming from outside Africa. There's also the conversation around how do we raise internal funding. For example, at DBN, uh, we, we know that our initial funding came from the main partners. You recall we did just a bond issue of about 20 billion. We need to raise capital internally. Uh, that's in, uh, in line with trying to also raise capital internally to be able to deploy to the mandates uh, we have. So that conversation is quite important. And as as uh, African organ African groups, uh, countries, and um, partnering with other um, development partners across, it's going to be able to collaborate and see how we can internally also raise some capital. Too. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And there's also conversation about uh, World Bank. I, I don't know if you were at uh, Mo Ibrahim and... I was, I was, I was a very, <laughs> very, interesting, very interesting conversation you know, there. The, the issue, issues around uh, the ratings yes. uh, not maybe not being uh, as objective as they should be, yes. not taking into consideration, you know, uh, uh, some of the things they should take into consideration, and even the World Bank itself uh, not being very clear about <laughs> the implementation, you yeah. know, of their of uh, their objective and vision. Yeah. Well, that very interesting conversation, and there's some very frank um, questions were raised by more, like you really said. Um, I think from the institutional perspective, the World Bank is of like so if you go add the response from the president of the World Bank, yes, some reforms need to be undertaken uh, in terms of how do you make things happen quickly. Um, then on the rating side, how do you, when you rate African countries, and you say most African countries are not um, investable in terms of uh, um, to enable them to have access to capital outside Africa. So the question is, what are the methodology do you use? What do you look out for vis-a-vis uh, -vis what um, is happening in other developing countries? And the question around it is, maybe if you come out with methodologies, look at for indices that you look at to show that a country is um, um, is, is ripe for investment or investable in, in that company, in the country. Those are the conversations that are very hard discussions that have to be. Uh, the rating agencies they have a template, and the template appears to be cut across, but. I think the question is, are you able to adapt them to meet the spe specific uh, um, realities of African countries? Uh, and if you look at African countries, have there been issues of um, default? Really, have we had that in terms of default? So I think that conversation is quite good. That how do we look at written uh, for African economies to ensure that you don't close them out from being able to have access to capital outside Africa? Mm. But, you know, I'm just thinking, must Africa continue to depend on this? Can we not find alternative yes. to, you know, waiting for the breaking rules institutions and, you know, the, develop, the developed economies, you know, to, you know, hand some things down to Africa? Yeah, it's a good conversation. I'd, I'd give you the example of even at DBN, what we did, uh, what we are doing, trying to also raise um, capital locally. Uh, I told you about the local bond which, which we issue. Yes, that conversation is real. Because Ac African countries to the economy so can also catalyze local funding to be able to meet some of the requirements. But the point is, where we are now, um, I don't think in terms of funding, more is out there than we have in Africa. But that does not mean that as African countries, we should not begin to have that move towards trying to raise funding internally. So that, that conversation is good. As more Africans create those um, different instruments to be able to raise funds internally, uh, that will help uh, the conversation. Mm. And when we talk about internally, I I know that uh, the World Bank president also challenged Africa, uh, for instance, talking about intra-African trade. Uh, it's um, you're not new to it. Uh, we have after, and yet we don't. We're not making much of it. Is it Africans uh, bringing Africa down? No, that's not. I think. We've, this conversation has been on for a long time. After I've come, uh, you know, now some barriers that have been there are trying to break those barriers, which is very, very important. You have to break those barriers uh, to into Africa trade. That's quite key. Issues of tariffs, issues about even um, logistics of moving goods around African countries and all that. Those are issues that you need to deal with. So it's not just talk about it, but these are practical issues that you need to deal with. And I think that's what Africa is trying to do. And I do see the potentials in the Africa, into Africa trade is quite huge. But why it's huge, you also have to have mechanism, you have to have a structure in place to enable that, that, that to be uh, governized into actual trade uh, within Africa and grow the volumes. So, and that is where you have to deal with all these issues around tariff, like as mentioned. How do you ensure, for example, in Africa, even traveling within Africa alone, you have issues around visas and around that. So, if you are not able to move goods, you know, logistically within uh, African countries, you have sometimes you have to go to Europe before you come back to African countries, or you have to go to other parts of the world before coming back to Africa. It's, it's quite a huge challenge. So some of these things, 
building infrastructure across Africa that enable you to do trade within African countries. Where, for example, you talk about building highways across Africa so that goods can move around Africa. You begin to have um, African countries have um, joint projects. Like, for example, you know the project, the gas project between Nigeria and Morocco. These are examples of things you can do that allow Africa uh, countries be able to trade among themselves. So this. Um, Putting together all the all this, you need to ensure that you break all the barriers that has gone. So it's not just talking about it; it's actually ensuring that they work. And um, I'm happy that so many African countries have signed on to the Africa, and we believe that that should begin to get the conversation going in a positive way. What should we be seeing after this? We have all the talks, great ideas, shared it, applaud it. You know what? What next? <laughs> Even if for no other country, for Nigeria, we have Nigeria is a participating country yeah. in in this meeting. Yeah. No, I think for Nigeria, it's again to we have to be able to measure uh, success by way of where are we do we have um, do we have milestones we want to achieve do we have timelines to achieve those milestones it's quite clear so that it's not just talk we say where are we in terms of the volume of trade we do now in terms of uh, our balance of payment balance of trade and all that and we use that to make sure that we're making progress with other African countries now we also look at some issues that might be impeding trade between other African countries and ensure that as we break the barriers we are measuring to see that actually in terms of volumes not Numbers, they are growing, so it's not just talk about it. So where are we today? Where are we in? Where were we in 2021? Where are we in 2022? And so on and so. So we have to deliberate about how we measure progress to ensure that it's not just talk around it. And for Nigeria in particular, I know there are some challenges around where you allow so many goods coming, whether the issue around um, the domestic um, companies being at risk, uh, but. If, you, if we, are, we position domestic companies to be able to pro, um, provide or produce competitive goods that uh, meet international standards and are quite competitive, of course, the market is also there uh, for that. So while the risk of maybe domestic challenges around domestic um, companies being threatened uh, by um, free inter African trade, there are also opportunities for you to be so um, you know, take your own goods out there to, in, the, in the outside market. So I think the deliberate action is how do we measure progress? Our measure of progress comes in specifics. Where were we last year? Where are we this year? And where do we plan to be in the, in the coming year and so on and so forth? And this, I guess, would be the responsibility of the federal government of Nigeria or the coordinating minister of the economy. Thank God he's around. Yes, well, well, that's the responsibility. And then, of course, we, we, we also have um, um, the, the Nigerian Export Promotion Council. You have the uh, Investment Promotion Council and all that to look at where are we in terms of that. And, of course, the institutions that are also directly responsible for exports to see how are they increasing, are we increasing our exports, given the this um, window and this uh, market that we have. So these are all that can be measured. But these figures, don't, they are quite straightforward to know where we are and where are we going. And that was an exclusive there with uh, Mr. Tony Aparachi, MD, Development Bank of Niger. Well, after nine days of intense um, deliberations, the curtains have fallen on the 2023 IMF World Bank annual meetings um, in Marrakesh, and a series of conversations have culminated in a unanimous perspective that the world economy is facing one of its worst uh, downturns yet. Some of the solutions preferred by the uh, world leaders include the need for countries to look inwards and uh, breaking of uh, trade barriers. Our correspondent, Inijo Makwa, again, who has been covering uh, events there, captures the highlights of the meetings. This is where we started it on Monday. Looks like a good place to close it. However, at this time, the crowd around and inside the campus has thinned out. But in the past six days, it's been a marathon of meetings. Global economic issues have been given a lot of attention from the economic outlook, which didn't give a lot of good news, but still offers hope. Elevated debt levels, rising funding costs, slowing growth, and an increasing mismatch between the growing demands on the state and available fiscal resources. Higher long-term growth can be achieved through a careful sequence of reforms. Nigeria got attention here, too. There's a downward revision for this year. Uh, partly this is because of the demonetization, the high inflation, the shocks to agriculture and hydrocarbon output. That's coming 
on top of those external headwinds. I would also add that President uh, Tinubu has moved quickly with important reforms, including ending uh, the fuel subsidies and unifying the official exchange rate. We welcome these initial bold reforms because we see them as paving the way towards stronger and inclusive growth. Also, an interest-free loan of $1.5 billion may be coming the way of Nigeria from the World Bank. Not at all about attached with um, qualifying for a World Bank funding to help finance um, development. In this particular case, it's what is it's long been in the pipeline and we're hoping that that funding will come through soon. And then to the G24, being a voice to their members and seeking better packages and condition. The world um, economic outlook is very uncertain and many of our countries have been at the receiving end of um, very high interest rates, very high inflation, currency volatility and in, because of all of that, um, their economic, um, they're facing quite a, a huge economic hardship. And so what we are calling for is that the IMF should ramp up its financing, the um, Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, and also the Resilience and um, Sustainability Facility. No doubt, the issue of debt cancellation is priority in the midst of huge debt burden on many emerging economies. For the World Bank President, Mr. Ejibanga, it's time for Africa to look inwards. You cannot solve the continent as a whole, but you can solve it by starting by smaller regions in the continent, looking at how you can promote intra-regional trade in Africa. A global trade debate was another interesting conversation here. The Director General of World Trade Organization, Dr. Ngozi Okunjewela, brought up the term re-globalization. Then, to build resilience, we need, yes, to deconcentrate and diversify those supply chains. And we are arguing that a good way to do it is not just to do it with your friends or those who are like you, but to spread your wings because we also have something called climate change. And if you cluster too many things, you don't know what phenomenon is going to happen. So why don't we look at developing economies that have the right business environment? And I insist on that. And see if we can diversify some supply chains there. So we build resilience. Some of these have been left out during the first wave of globalization. So we can build resilience whilst being inclusive. And we're calling that re-globalization. Alongside the serious business, Marrakesh was exposed to a lot of foreigners who would otherwise have not visited. Participants got to know the culture and the city. enough time to tell you all that happened in Marrakesh in the last one week but well, these are the high points we can bring to you and so from here the city that has been called a luxurious city I'm going back home to Nigeria in John Mekwa reporting for channels television news now we're definitely expecting you John Bekwa uh, right here back to uh, Lagos they were giving us a summary of uh, the proceedings uh, right there at Marrakesh. Well, let's um, move from there now to London, to get a check on what's happening um, in London now with our uh, London correspondent, uh, Juliana. Great to have you, Juliana, good morning. Um, UK wholesale gas prices have seen have risen to the highest level since February. What's driving that? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Good morning, Aladi. What's driving that is the cold weather. It's absolutely freezing um, in the UK, literally. I think overnight temperatures plunged to about zero degrees, a complete contrast to what we were seeing in early October because of the extreme weather patterns. It was actually uh, quite warm, but it's not that way now. And we know that um, gas uh, produces um, part of electricity. I believe 10% of electricity in the UK 
is coming from gas and this is a major concern because we are getting to uh, very cold parts of the year lots of people are going to be turning up their gas and the difference between this year and last year is that there are no uh, buffers from the British government to try and push down uh, some of those energy prices and this has been the case since February 2022 following the invasion of the Kremlin into Ukraine uh, lots of European countries particularly here in the UK they started uh, weaning themselves off Russian gas and that of course meant that demand elsewhere and prices were much higher. Uh, also the war between Israel and Hamas has meant that certain gas pipes in Israel have been shut. In fact, according to some reports, the Tamar natural gas field has actually uh, been compromised. So there are several issues, but I think the main issue uh, from Friday's reading, which showed that it was the highest uh, price for a unit of gas in six months, is the fact that this is going to trickle down into bills at a time when it is getting uh, much more colder. And if you are living in the UK, then you're definitely going to have to uh, push up your thermometer. Right, right, quite quite interesting. Thermostat. Definitely Thermostat. we hope it doesn't get that cold uh, right there. But uh, I know it you're is. I know you're a Manu fan, um Juliana. I, I am a Manu fan um to myself. And we see the British uh billionaire uh, Sir Jim uh, Jim Ratcliffe will buy a twenty five percent stake of Manchester United um football club. How are the fans and analysts reacting to this? Yes, I'm, I am an MUFC fan. Um, I've not watched a game or a match in a very long time. Uh, but yeah, this is a major news um, on the social media platforms at the moment uh, because as any Manchester United fan or football fan would know, um, fans have, um, I would have called it a love-hate relationship, but it appears to be hate relationship with the majority owner of Manchester United, which is the Glazer family. Um, they have owned the majority stake in Manchester United for several years and if you look at what's happened to the club since their takeover certainly we have seen a decline in our performance um, due to the fan uh, backlash I think it was in November 2022 um, that the Glazer family said look you know they were looking for a buyer um, on the New York Stock Exchange Manchester United have the market capitalization of about 3.3 billion pounds um, dollars there was a run off between a Qatari billionaire and the petrochemical billionaire uh, Jim Ratcliffe and it does appear although we are still waiting for complete confirmation that Sir Jim Ratcliffe has actually purchased 25% of the club um, for 1.3 billion dollars now there are several things that need to take place to try and turn around the fortunes of Manchester United including the look and feel of Old Trafford which at one point in England was probably um, the most alluring stadium but since uh, the takeover several stadiums including the, the, the most recent one in Tottenham have had brand new makeovers uh, staff are being looked after well and I think that's what fans want to see uh, with Sir Jim Ratcliffe's involvement now obviously Ineos which is the pet chemical firm that Sir Jim Ratcliffe owns that is not a sporting company however it does have a sporting arm and I think there are suggestions that perhaps Sir Jim Ratcliffe isn't just going to be sitting um, on these shares that in fact he is going to be able to uh, run the business operations but we shall wait and see I think the most important thing is that we want to be at the top of the league um, as we once were, were, were in the glory days and I think Beckham his uh, new Netflix series has uh, made us all reminisce on the days when we got the triple trophy and uh, hopefully Sir Jim Ratcliffe will be able to bring it home again. Yeah, Julian, I hope we do get back to um, winning ways. Yeah, I did watch uh, Beckham's uh, story there on Netflix. Quite, quite touching. I miss those days, you know, days of Sir Alex uh, Ferguson. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Julian. I catch you at one. No more football talk from me. <laughs> exactly. No problem. That's the best I can do. Fantastic. All right. Let's uh, get a check on uh, other markets there. Julian has given us the details uh, from London now. Let's um, head on to the local boss there and the capital market right here in Nigeria. We see uh, the FX market there. We've got some uh, big, big uh, volumes. Look at the all share index. Also for the equities market, we see it did end in the green um, last week. Take a look. Look at the uh, board there, 1.12%. That's the number uh, for the Nigerian stock market. Uh, equity cap, 36.92 um, trillion. That's uh, 
a big move up there, 1.12%. That's the close for the week. Um, last week for the all share index, there's 67,200 points. Let's look at the trading activity now. We see volume uh, for the week down 39.6%, uh, 1.40 billion uh, units. Value there, 24.43 billion now. That's the value we got up 9.9% for the week. And deals for the whole week also in the green, 29,683 uh, deals. Look at the um, sectoral performance, just the banking counter. In the red, closed uh, for the week, 0.78% uh, down, even though we got you know, some bullish news uh, for the financial sector there. Consumer goods closed in the green, 1.56%. But the biggest mover there was uh, industrial, industrial goods up 5.03%. Uh, Let's look at the top trades now. See the top trades, uh, we see Axis Holdings, uh, Nimeth, and Fidelity. Uh, what are the top trades uh, for last week? Let's get a check on the FX market. Now we see uh, the FX market, big volume there, 109.84% uh, change week on week in the FX spot market, $682.92 uh, million. I was traded in the total uh, market there, we see 109.52% uh, up. Let's get a check on the FX market now. Joining me is uh, Mr. Bosu. Our uh, Bembe fixed income dealer, Access Bank. Good morning, great to have you. Good morning, Ladi. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. So, um, what are you expecting for the bond um, auction? I guess that's coming today. And how do you see this um, influencing sentiments in the secondary market? Uh, so, for for to this today, we have a bond auction, uh, 360 uh, billion uh, on 20, 29, 20, 20, 33, and 38 and 53. Uh, if you look at last week, uh, it was a very busy week for fixed income market last week. Uh, that was the cook uh, auction where uh, the demo was willing to raise about. Uh, uh, the, uh, 150 billion and uh, ended up raising 350 billion. Um, so the subscription was over 600 billion. So we expect that uh, some of the unmet uh, demand from the subscription should come into this auction. So I expect the, the yield at this option to, 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 to go up, given that the liquidity uh, will have reduced from the 350 billion that will have been mopped out on Friday. So the stock rate on each of the majority to, should go up to entice investors. Yeah, investors really need to be enticed uh, at this uh, time. But we're expecting inflation numbers for September um, today. What are you expecting and how this um, drive investor sentiment? So for the inflation figures, uh, my expectation is the, 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 the figure should go up. Uh, if you look at the component, the major component driving the inflation has in the food uh, inflation, which hasn't, uh, it's still volatile. Uh, so for me, I think, uh, and the, the inflation, the increase is already been, if we price into the, the stock rate at the auction today. Um, we see, I still expect that uh, the, you look at the FX, the FX is still an issue. So, which is the major thing that is driving this uh, price of gold? Like, the, if you look at, if you if you go shopping, you you would know that there is really there is inflation. So the ratio for me, I think it should, it should increase. Inflation ratio increase, yes. Yeah, and, and definitely we saw food inflation was about 29% last time. I hope it doesn't cross that 30% level, um, hopefully. But uh, we've seen the um, uh, last week got that uh, big news from the CBN and banning the 43 items. How do you see this impacting the FX market? And um, give, give me your outlook for the week. So on the uh, the uh, the publication from CBN, that was the first uh, chess move. Uh, this is a is a very is a very good move. However, uh, I think uh, the most important thing is uh, the, what CBN has shown is is there is no bifurcated market. It's just one market. You don't have one market called the parallel market or official market. It's just one market. Uh, but the what the major thing the CBN has to do is to actually come into the market to intervene because. Uh, the objective is to actually reduce the rate at the uh, the demand at the alternative market. But by the time this demand leaves the, the uh, parallel market and comes to the official market, then the rate at the official market will go up. So I expect that the the, the rate uh, will go up, uh, but CBN has to come to intervene to that to 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 make the to defend the naira. And in terms of expectation for the week, uh, like you said, uh, we expect a coupon payment uh, of about 145 billion coming this week, and the bond auction to about 360 billion. Uh, so we, I expect that on the money market space, I expect that the rate will trade as single digit, though it will go up. Last week we were at one percent level. On the FX, I expect rate to depreciate in the FX segment. Why on the bond space, I expect a a, a, a bearish sentiment this week. 
All right, we all want the CBN to, you know, to defend the Naira, but we all must do our own part, too, to defend the Naira. Um, hopefully, let's be trotic here. Thank you so much, Mr. Bosso of MBA. It was great having you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, let's um, head on to other markets now. Talking about the uh, crypto uh, market, there we see uh, Bitcoin price found support near the 26,550 level, and we see the color on the screen. It's green. We have green on the screen starting off the week, 3.79% uh, for Bitcoin. Then we see Bitcoin dominance sitting at 49.65%, almost uh, 50%. Ethereum, 1.94%. So it's more green that we have right now in the crypto market. And we're looking at the sentiment there, uh, talking about the fear greed index in the market, showing how investors are feeling in the market. And it's neutral. It's not bearish. It's not bullish. Just somewhere in the middle. Cryptocurrencies, uh, we track the top 100, we see Bitcoin there, $27,912 this morning. Big jump uh, this morning, 3.79%. Ethereum holding up at $1,584, um, losing that 1.6 level, trying to get back up there. BNB, native uh, coin for the Binance Exchange, $213. And we see XRP, 49 uh, cents. Let's bring in Olumide Additional now, financial market analyst. Hello, Olumide, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Ladi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so Lumde, we did get that tweet um, over the weekend uh, from MetaMask. That's uh, uh, where traders normally keep most of their assets, you know, in the crypto market is decentralized. Uh, we see, uh, we got that news that MetaMask, uh, they got removed from the App Store, uh, but later it, it got returned. I'm sure that um, sent shockwaves down the, the industry. How you seen it? Yeah, interesting because uh, MetaMask plays a non-custodial influence in the crypto space. Just like you rightly said, uh, they are the most popular um, custodian wallet in terms of a uh, non-custodial wallet for um, Terrify. And um, I think interestingly, uh, that was sorted within a couple of hours. So uh, that didn't really put in much trigger, trigger in the market. But what we're seeing in the market right now is that uh, the, the risk sentiment from um, Iran, the United States, around um, the ongoing amounts Israel war has really helped uh, appetite for risk. And that's why you're seeing good lose about 1%, the US dollar also uh, moderating in value. And that triggered buying pressure and big conduct as well as um, breaking the 28,000 resistance level once again. So we see hot coins breaking, in, including BNB. Uh, but having said that, I think uh, the space is becoming evolving. We're seeing new or protocols and mechanism coming, particularly um, liquid staking, which allows uh, um, uh, participants not just uh, staking their um, assets, also taking part in liquidity. And the interesting thing is that uh, because uh, unlike traditional staking, where uh, you can't uh, be involved, uh, you can uh, liquid staking is much more efficient. So that also brings in some glamour in this space. But I think the elephant in the room is the United States, uh, United States uh, Security Exchange Commission uh, decided not to take appeal on um, gray skills uh, Bitcoin ETF. So it's looking more likely that we're going to get in a Bitcoin spot ETF, and definitely that will break in traditional inflows because what the market has been lacking um, in the past couple of years is liquidity. You recall the market was once valued over three trillion dollars. Right now, the market is just moving around the one trillion dollar mark. So. Uh, Ladi, it's been very interesting the market, but it looks like an exciting green day for the crypto space. This yeah, morning. yeah, it's, it's, it started off the week uh, quite a, a interesting. And talking about that um, narrative now in the crypto space, that's uh, liquid staking. Do you think it's something that's gonna is gonna last? You know, in the market, this narrative because it's getting quite bullish um, right now. We're seeing you know uh, 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 coins that have to do with liquid staking. They're beginning to move in price. Is that a narrative that will last? Yeah, I think it will because if you look at the uh, look at the opportunities and an hybrid of traditional staking, uh, you, it unlocks liquidity, it um, maximizes yield farming, and also uh, it brings the narrative back of crypto back coin uh, um, back, uh, loans. So you can be uh, becoming participants and also the, uh, getting your rewards. So yes, it's a more efficient way. But there are concerns. You know, you call. Uh, what happens to Luna? Uh, there's what we say price depending. It amplifies price depending because volatility can, might not be able, uh, is not controllable. Uh, you cannot really control the market volatility of that protocol. Then also, it also brings smart contract risk, you know. 
and this is another problem we have the risk of uh, bugs and um, compromised attacks so despite the positivity around the space uh, one will say that regulatory uh, stance is the big tool of this because we keep seeing the crypto space coming out with innovative products but over, over the years we've seen that dark actors or illicit players are taking advantage of some of the uh, loopholes in this and we, we saw what happened in the uh, farm um, products. So I, I think for me the positives around it is how regulation would um, happen but they are interesting uh, projects and yes it looks like the buzz right now but you know that was what happened to NFTs and other like uh, innovative projects. Yeah, the narratives keep coming up uh, in, in this market. Thank you so much, uh, Olumide, financial market analyst. Thank you for having me. All right, so uh, that's a, a wrap on the program now. That's uh, how the crypto market is looking. Don't forget you can visit www.channelcv.com for more updates. Also, follow us on social media. Uh, just search for Channel Television all over, and you can find us. From me and the team uh, from Channels HQ right here in Lagos, it's bye for now.